Hey, welcome back to the Gardener Rebel channel. And today I'm actually going to be in the garden that was damaged with the flood a couple, well, let's say just a week ago. I think it might've been a week ago, Monday. So we're like 10, 11 days out. And I wanna show you what's taking place. As you can tell, uh, the tomatoes are coming along excellent. Now we've got some dead vineage which means I've got some dead little limbs all down the tomato plants from the flood. And it did knock off quite a bit of young tomatoes. So our initial harvest that I was hoping for, eh, it's not gonna be that great. But we do have some wonderful tomato plants. And I'm gonna be tying them up today with some jute string. Uh, the reason I use jute besides yarn is jute it rots really easy through the winter months and when we get over here with our garden equipment like tillers tractors things of that nature this stuff actually doesn't wrap up around the bearings or the bushings and work its way down in there around the rubber seals and eat the bearings up so i use this because it's easily disposed of you really don't have to worry about it like you do a yarn a polyester yarn or uh fishing string or masonry string so this is what I use a lot of the times you know I'll use whatever I can find honestly laying around but this is what I prefer so let's take a real quick look around see how the gardens progress and I'm going to tie some tomatoes up because the sun is really beating down in North Georgia today and we are expecting a few little thunderstorms today so Ignore the mess in the garden. We're still cleaning up, trying to salvage what we can. But, you know, for so for less than a $100 bill, I'm not complaining at all. So give me a second, and we'll look around and see what we get to harvest today. All right. Now, these cantaloupe plants are just absolutely full of blooms. And you can see a honeybee down in there working them. Now, the thing about a gardening and honeybees, let me tell you from experience, you are not going to get a million bees in your garden if you put a beehive around there. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. There's very few items in a garden that a honeybee will go to to pollinate. Cantaloupes, watermelon, squash, uh, a little bit of the cucumbers and some corn. You very rarely ever see them on a tomato plant. But I want you to look. Now I've got to get over and tie these guys up. But look at the size of these tomatoes. Okay. Look at that right there. Baseball size tomatoes. These are the pink girls. Look at the clusters. Just hanging on. Waiting for us to come down here and pick. Look how thick these tomato vines are. Now you gotta remember, I do not use some of the things that the online gardeners use. And I'm not faulting them. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm not saying they're right. I'm saying you have to garden the way you want to garden. My actions and my comments I only show you what I've done with my space. Now, if you remember, this is the Epsom salt test, correct? Notice the difference. All right, Epsom salt. And I went by the guidelines. I went by the rule book. Look at this. Look at these guys. Planted the same time, the same day, the same soil, except that one got Epsom salt. Now look at these guys. A little bit of chicken litter, a little bit of triple 19 fertilizer, and this is what we've got. Now, as you can tell, this is the flood water damage right here. Uh, there's not much we can do. So hopefully they'll snap back. We'll get a good crop off of them this year. As you can tell, they're still loaded with blooms. They're coming out good. Uh, these are six foot tall and growing, and I'm really excited about it. 
So we are going to have some tomatoes sometime soon. Watching a tomato ripen hmm, is like being a kid on December the 1st and looking at Christmas presents all month long. It takes forever. But hey, one tip. Um, if you've got birds pecking at your tomatoes, which I usually don't, I don't have that problem here. But if you do in your garden or on your pots or on your porch or your uh, flower beds, your raised beds, whatever you want to call them. Uh, if you have some old red Christmas tree ornaments, you can take those out and hang those along your trellis or on your vines or your weave, however you supported your tomatoes this year. And the birds will actually start pecking at those. Once they realize there's nothing coming out of them, they tend to leave them alone. But that's just a quick little tip. All right, now everybody remembers the little bitty brandy wines that we planted, what, two weeks ago? Three foot, three and a half foot tall and growing. Looking good. We're actually going to let that one grow just a little bit more before I tie it to the stake. But looking good. I'm really surprised. And just to show you the jalapenos, how well they done during the flood. We've got four plants. Four plants was two dollars and fifty cents for the carton, and uh, they're doing well. But just look at the back side of these tomatoes. You know, I mean, really. Get in here and just look. That's a pretty good sized tomato right there. You know, over baseball size. Now the sweet potatoes, I don't really have a lot of hope for. The corn's coming up really well this time. <laughs> I think the squirrels got the message. I think they did finally. <laughs> These tomato plants, did not do well at all through the flood. And uh, it's just one of those things. But look at this guy, over six foot tall. This is a guy that I like having my picture made with. You know, and I think they would have done really well if we hadn't had such wet weather and uh, the travesty of the flood hit through here and just you know, done a lot of damage to them. But, you know, greater powers than I decided to flood. Now, here was the plant that we had that was in our compost pile. And uh, it's starting to bloom. So here in a couple of days, maybe another week, we'll be pulling vegetables off of that. And that's about it. I'm really pleased with the way... Uh, things turned out we are going to be clearing off some more of this area next year and building a berm right through there because I like this spot it's out of the way uh, it leaves a larger yard for the kids to to ride their four-wheelers in and their motorcycles and it's going to give me a chance to kind of clear off some of the vegetation throughout here and next year we're going to try to put some goats and fence it in and uh, let the animals clean up naturally and then we'll go from there but this is a big enough garden for me and Karen by all means this right here this one spot and uh, maybe something planted into the 30 by 30 and just keep pumpkins and watermelon over in the front of the house next year because the kids like to do the watermelons they just love it and you know I don't, I'm not going to take that away from them well there is one watermelon plant that made it but as you can tell it is a very good looking plant but everything in this upper corner was just destroyed so no sense in crying over spilt milk we at least got a little bit of milk left in the glass that's one way to look at it But, I can't complain. It's looking good for what it's been through. And I'm very grateful for that. 
I just wish I could have proven to you guys how much I could do with $100, a little bit of sweat, and a very small piece of ground. Maybe next year we'll do it again. All right, I'm sitting here next to the beehive that we found in the flood, and I'm happy to say, in one aspect I'm happy to say, the queen's in there and she is laying, and I actually pulled a frame out yesterday and saw bees hatching on it that had went through that flood a week ago. And it kind of makes me wish I had waited to pull some of the frames out that I thought were a complete loss uh, to see if they would hatch. I've learned from my mistakes now. So that's one thing I, I am, the bright side to being flooded out was that. I did learn something about beekeeping, about how tough these guys really are. Uh, and they just keep on going, I'm telling you, they, do, they really do. But anyhow, getting back to the video, We've been lucky so far. We come through a flood. We come through excessive rain. This hasn't been the best growing season I've ever had, but we're going to keep doing this. We're going to keep doing it every year, and I'm going to keep videoing it, and we're going to try different plants. Uh, I had a very nice lady and her husband give me some plants last week in exchange for a head of cabbage, some squash and zucchini. We've actually got an eggplant, which I've never tried, and several uh, herbs that she sent to us. Uh, basil and things of that nature so I you know that's really great I love getting stuff like that to try it out uh, however I've had a few comments and I, and I just want to address it about why don't I try the back to Eden uh, style of gardening well How can I put this and not, you know, I'm not trying to upset nobody because I garden the way I garden and I think every gardener should do it their way. I believe that you're born with a gift of how you want to do things and your things may work for you and they might not work for me. Uh, back to Eden type of garden is not my cup of tea. You know, I like to plow my ground uh, in the area I'm in. It is very active with wildlife such as skunks, squirrels, uh, raccoons, deer, wild pigs, rattlesnakes, copperheads, uh, fire ants, and those creatures are grown to insects and to areas that hold warmth throughout the year. And when you're putting that much compost on the ground, if you've ever seen a compost pile during the wintertime smoke when you stick a shovel in, it's because it's, it's, it's going through a chemical process and it's heating up. Uh, you can't lay a two by four down on the ground here for an hour or you've got a fire ant nest under it. So for me, that's a no-no. That's one of the, the negative sides to it that I see. The second negative side to it is I'm not going to cut trees down on my property and mulch up and chip up and come out cost effective compared to what I'm doing now. Uh, and I'm not going to get trees off of somebody else's property that a commercial tree service is bringing because the government entities, the power companies, the phone companies, the state people, the federal people spray pre-emergent and herbicides on all of that state right away, local uh, power lines, things of that nature. And that is your tree service's biggest customers. In the state of Georgia alone, we contracted out what they call right-of-way reclamation statewide. And these guys are dumping these mulch uh, trucks out in people's yards. And last month, we just went through and sprayed it with Razor Pro, uh, Roundup, everything that the state could use legally we sprayed those right-of-ways with to kill back the grass and the evasive weeds. And people are unknowingly putting this in their flower beds and on their garden. Uh, I think it's, uh, 
I think it's good that people want to do that if it works for them. I think there's a lot of hype to it. But if you've ever seen a copperhead and you've seen a bed of mulch, well, that's, that's a snake bite waiting to happen in this area. And I'm not willing to risk my grandkids or another person or another person's children because I have an idea of going back to Eden. You know, that's just my opinion. And I'm gonna stick with it within a day or so. So until next time, I'm the Gardener Rebel and I'm out of here. And I hope to see y'all next time back at the garden spot. So get your gardening on and maybe you're able to pick some stuff this week. Until next time, y'all have a great week.